Amen. So you're there in Hosea chapter 6. So we've been studying through the book of Hosea. Hosea is a prophet, again, who is a prophet to the northern kingdom of Israel under King Jeroboam. Not the first King Jeroboam, but the third son of Jehu the king. And he is preaching against the northern kingdom of Israel. We see this object lesson where um, actually Hosea went out and married Gomer, this this uh, prostitute that God wanted to show the adultery of the nation through this uh, extreme, you know, as we reread it, it's an extreme object lesson. And really, the first few chapters up to chapter number six have just been God like just preaching against the northern kingdom of Israel. He's throwing Judah in there, here and there, because they got mixed up with the northern kingdom. Of Israel, he told Judah, you know, you should have stayed away. You should have kept your borders. You should have not mixed up with these evil people. Again, remember that the northern kingdom of Israel pretty much went, they went into idolatry right away under King uh, Jeroboam, the first Jeroboam. He set up the two golden calves and they went into idolatry right away. Judah, you know, was, was right for longer and had better kings that were all of David's dynasty, all right? So in Hosea chapter number six, however, we see a little bit of a shift in tone, and that's what I really wanna focus on this evening. Let's look down at Hosea chapter six. So, so far it's been this object lesson and just this judgment, and we kinda see it go back to this judgment where you, know, you filled this city with blood, and you know, you were, you know, you're an idolatrous nation, you're an adulterous nation. Again, adulterous meaning they turned away from the one true God. We see that in the last few verses, again, of the chapter. But the first verses of Hosea chapter number 6, we see something else. And that's what I want to point out um, in the sermon this evening. So look down, if you would, at Hosea chapter number 6. Look at verse number 1, and let's get into it this evening and see what the Bible has for us. In verse number 1, the Bible says, Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn and he will heal us. He hath smitten and he will bind us up. So here we see, this is a little bit different tone here from Hosea. We see right away in verse number one, we see an appeal. We see an appeal to the nation. An appeal, and I'm going to really focus on that appeal later on towards the end of the sermon, but he's appealing to them to, you know, turn away from the things that they've been doing. Look at verse number two. Look at verse number two. So we're going to go back to verse number one in a few minutes. But look at verse number two. It says, after two days will he revive us. In the third day he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. So a little bit of a reference there, kind of a forward reference to the resurrection, to the Messiah there, um, the coming um, of Jesus. Of course, he was raised up um, on the third day. Look at verse number three. And then shall we know, you know, the Bible's you know, full of all these little nuggets, like these little prophecy Nuggets, if you're looking for them, you can find them. But look at verse number three. It says, Then shall we know, if we follow on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and the former rain unto the earth. So in verse number three, we see what God is, you know, what he's prepared to do for us, and it compares, you know, the goodness of God towards a nation that turns back to him as rain. Okay, so remember that, um, and go to verse number four. And it says, O Ephraim. So Ephraim, again, is kind of this, just kind of a reference. It was the, the largest tribe of the northern kingdom, so it's kind of like all of, it, all of the northern kingdom he's kind of talking about here. It says, O Ephraim, what shall I do unto thee? O Judah, what shall I do unto thee for your goodness. So now God is talking about, he talked about his goodness is like the rain. Okay. His goodness is like the rain, but look what he compares our goodness to. He says, our goodness is as a morning cloud and as the early dew it goeth away. So God is the rain and we are the dew or the morning cloud and it goeth away. So we need a little science lesson here, okay? So what's happening in Fresno now, now that it's getting colder? What are you starting to see in the sky? You're starting to see a lot of clouds in the sky, right? So God is literally, this is just such a brilliant little comparison of our goodness versus God's goodness, because look, he says, because, it, let's just go to the next two verses, then I'll come back and I'll explain this. He says, therefore, I've hewed them by the prophets, I've slain them by the words of my mouth, and thy judgments are as the light that goeth forth. 
For I desired mercy and not sacrifice. I already explained that to you a couple weeks ago. And the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Right? He just wants you to know what his word says and do his word. But again, he compares our goodness to the dew and to a morning cloud. All right? you, ever heard the, you ever heard the statement? You ever heard like a, an older person or a farmer or somebody say, like, yeah, these clouds will burn off midday. You ever heard that statement? That the clouds will burn off? So God is comparing us, our goodness towards what? Towards him as dew and as a morning cloud. Well, what happens is, is dew, when I was explaining this to the kids on the way to church this morning, but we have to have a little science lesson if you want to understand what God is talking about here. So basically, when it, the reason you see clouds is because when the air gets colder, so cold air is like a small sponge, meaning it can't hold much water, okay? The hotter air gets, the bigger the sponge is, the more water it can hold in, in a gas state, in a gaseous state, okay? But what happens is, when you have water in a, in a, uh, a certain volume of air, and then you cool that volume of air down, at some point, this is what's called the dew point, at some point, at some temperature that's dropping of that air, that water can, that air can no longer hold that water, so it releases it into condensation. So it becomes water droplets. And that's why when it gets colder in Fresno, you start to see clouds in the sky, because the clouds are water droplets. They're simply water droplets in the sky. That's why when it's 115 degrees, you're going to see no clouds because the air can hold so much moisture that it's all, none of it is going to condense. All right, so that's what God is talking about. So he's talking about in the morning, in the morning, now is it colder or hot? Is that the morning the coldest or the hottest part of the day? It's the coldest. It's actually starting to get kind of chilly out. That's why you see fog in the morning. Fog is just a cloud that's sitting on the ground. You see fog in the morning, and then as the day warms up, what happens? The fog always it burns off, but it doesn't burn off. What actually happens is the air heats up and those water droplets, they evaporate into a, a gas and you can't see them anymore because the, the air is hot enough where it can, it's a big sponge and it can absorb all that moisture, all right? The air heats up past its dew point and it just absorbs all. That's why the clouds burn off. So that's why the morning cloud, it goes away. But it's interesting to note and the dew, it also goes away, right? What happens to the dew? The sun comes out and the dew is on the grass because what happened was the air released its moisture and it condensed onto the blades of grass or the trees or whatever it was. And then as the sun comes up, it heats up and that moisture, it evaporates back into the air. So the dew and the morning cloud, that moisture, all that to say this, and you think I'm overthinking this, but I'm not. This is exactly what it means. He's saying that that moisture that's on the blades of grass, the dew and the morning clouds, it goes back into the atmosphere. It, go, it goes away. It does not go anywhere that is useful. So God is saying our goodness is fleeting. Our goodness lasts only a short period of time. And unlike his goodness, our goodness does not go towards fruitfulness because it's fleeting, okay? Now, think about this for a second. Think about God's blessings. Think about God's blessings. He compares his blessings as rain, okay? God compares his goodness towards us as rain. Turn to Isaiah chapter number 55. Isaiah chapter number 55. And I'm just going to give you one example of this in the Bible, but rain is considered a blessing all over the Bible. All right. And look, it's, it's, if you've ever grown things or you've, you've farmed or you've planted a garden or grown trees or whatever it is, rain is like nothing quite waters things like the rain. I mean, you can put in irrigation systems, you can put sprinklers in your yard, whatever you want to do. And, you know, we obviously have to do that in Fresno. You have to irrigate things or everything's just going to die because it's an irrigated desert here. But the point is, there's nothing like the rain. There is nothing that covers and grows things and really gets to where it needs to get like the rain does, all right? I mean, sprinklers, drip lines, all these things, they can't really reproduce just a really good rain. But what happens to the rain? 
Where does the rain go? I mean, did you know that trees, like the leaves of trees, they're literally designed to catch the rain? Think about it for a second. You got a big tree and you got the canopy of the tree and when it rains, whether it's blowing rain this way or that way, that canopy just catches all that rain and just dumps it right on the roots of the tree. It's like a big funnel for the rain. That's what the, tr the tree's leaves are designed for, right? They're designed to catch it. Look at Isaiah chapter 55 and verse number 10. Look what the Bible says. It says, for as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven... Don't get me started on the snow. The snow is the same thing, but God doesn't really call that out in Hosea chapter number 6. As the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither. Notice that. Notice how the rain doesn't drop down on the leaf of the tree and then go back up. The rain makes it all the way where it needs to go. It says, but watereth the earth and make it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to to the eater. See, God's rain, God's goodness actually produces fruit. It doesn't just, it's just not there for a little bit and then goes away like our goodness. God's goodness, his rain, his goodness is compared to the rain that gets to the roots of the tree and produces actual fruit. And then he compares, you know, that blessing, that watering, that rain in verse number 11 to God's word. So look, if you apply God's word to your life, it'll make it to the roots like the rain will. And it will produce, if you actually not just read it, not just listen to it, but you actually apply it to your life, it will produce fruit in your life. It'll produce fruit in your family for generations. It'll produce fruit in souls that are saved when you go out soul winning, all through the, the blessing of God's word. He says, so shall my word be that goeth forth. Producing, just comparing that goodness. So how does God give his goodness to me as he says in Hosea chapter 6? He compares it to rain, but he gives his goodness to us through his word. Through what he tells us to do through his word. And if we receive that word, that goodness will not stop and that goodness will produce fruit. Simple, right? But isn't it just, it, it's just a great analogy of, you know, the, the goodness that we bring. <laughs> like, some days we're like, yeah, I'm, I'm into this. And some days we're like, yeah, I'm into what's going on over here in the world. God's saying to this nation, he's saying to us, he's like, you know, don't, don't be like that. I'm like the rain. And you're fleeting. Look, it's a bad trade is what God is trying to show us. God is trying to show us that this fleeting loyalty that we have to him for short-term pleasures, whatever those pleasures may be, you know, in our lives, you know, whether it's, you know, sin for a season, whether it's just, you know, ignoring, you know, the word of God, just whether it's just like just deciding I'm not going to grow in this particular area, whatever it is, it's a bad trade for these lasting blessings that God can give us, that his goodness will last forever. Look at verse number, go to Psalm chapter 145 and look at verse number 4. Go to Psalm chapter number, uh, chapter 145, look at verse number 4. I mean, God literally says that his reign, his word, his goodness will last for generations for us. Look at Psalm 145, look at verse number 4. Psalm 145, look at verse number 4. The Bible says, One generation shall praise thy works to another and shall declare thy mighty acts. It's saying that one generation is going to talk about, you know, is going to teach the next generation the goodness that God has and how the, you know, God's goodness is his word. It's like the rain. It'll produce fruit. I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty and of thy wondrous works. And men shall speak of the mighty, of the, thy terrible acts, and I will declare thy greatness. They shall abundantly utter the memory of thy great goodness. See that? and shall sing of thy righteousness. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. That's kind of the point of Hosea chapter number 6. God is saying, like, you know, turn things around and my goodness is still there. My goodness will still be there. Slow to anger of great mercy. The Lord is good to all. Notice the word good again, again. And his tender mercies are over all his works. And thy works shall praise thee, O Lord, and thy saints shall bless thee. 
They shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and thy dominion endureth throughout all generations. That's how long God's goodness will last. I mean, that's why he says he'll pervert, preserve his word for us for forever throughout all generations. The goodness of God's word is here for all generations. We are able to pass it on. That's one of the huge blessings of God's word, God's goodness. And again, but what do we do? We trade, we trade generational blessings for selfish de desires in our lives. That, that, that's what we do. But God's goodness will still be there. It's always there. Go back to Hosea chapter number 6. Go back to Hosea chapter number 6. Again, our, our goodness towards God is fleeting. Our goodness towards God is fleeting. Sometimes it's there. Sometimes it's not. It's short term. We trade short term for, you know, we want short term and we don't want the long term, you know, goodness from God. That's why in Hosea chapter 6 and verse number 1, there is just this plea from Hosea, you know, from the word of God through Hosea, come and let us return unto the Lord. It's saying return unto the Lord. And he will what? He will heal us. He hath smitten, but he will bind us up. He's saying, look, we may have gone through some judgment. He's saying, but just get things right. And that's kind of the point of the sermon tonight is, is this, why not get right? As a Christian, no matter what's going on in your life, why not get right? Why not? Turn to Deuteronomy chapter number one. Why not just own everything completely? And look, I mean, the Bible is clearly, clearly says, like, if you know the Bible and you're in church and you read the Bible, you will know when you're not right. I mean, one of the things that God's word does, and we talked about this a couple weeks ago too, but it makes sin exceedingly sinful. If you're reading your Bible and you're in church and you're, you know, you're spiritually minded and you're in the word of God, you're going to see sin and it's going to be like, whoa, that's sin. The problem with the world out there today is they can't recognize sin anymore. They don't know what's sin. That's why you'll get somebody who maybe just got saved, gets new into church, they've never even opened the Bible before, and they're going to just be in discovery mode. They're going to be in discovery mode for a year, two years. I'm just like, I didn't even know this stuff was wrong. But that's not the mature Christian. The mature Christian who's read his or her Bible, who's been in the Bible, they know when they're wrong. That sin is, it's exceeding to them. Paul says in Romans. Because that's what the Bible does. The Bible can't perfect you, but it can make sin exceedingly sinful to you. It will pop it out right at you. So why not, when we know that we're in sin, that we're backslidden, that we've done something wrong in some area, why not get right? I want to show you, you know, there's two reasons. There's two main reasons that people don't get right. And they're both stupid reasons. But turn to Deuteronomy chapter number one. I mean, why not? Just why not? And I'm going to give you two reasons why people don't. They're, they're both not good reasons. But look at Deuteronomy chapter number one. And look at verse number 37 for the first one. The first one is people don't want to deal with consequences of getting right. And that's a silly one because getting right, you know, if you don't get right, consequences are going to be worse. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 1 and look at verse number 37. So this is talking about the children of Israel, you know, in Deuteronomy chapter 1, kind of recapping why they were not that one generation, basically Joshua's generation, except Joshua and Caleb, were not allowed to go into the promised land. They had to wander for 40 years in the wilderness. He's kind of, you know, detailing why they were, you know, made to wander for 40 years and only their children and Joshua and Caleb would be able to go over to the promised land across the Jordan. Look at verse number 37. It says, Also the Lord was angry with me for your sake, saying, Thou also shalt not go in thither. But Joshua the son of Nun, which standeth before thee, he shall go in thither, talking about the promised land, encourage him. For he shall cause Israel to inherit it. Moreover, your little ones, which he said should be a prey in your children, which in that day had no knowledge between good and evil, they shall go in thither, 
and unto them will I give it, and they shall possess it. But as for you, talking about the generation of people, you know, remember the ten spies, you know, all gave this evil report, this report like, oh, these people are too big and we can't take over that country. These, they've got all kinds of resources and there's giants everywhere. But as for you, he's talking to those people now, turn you and take your journey into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. Then ye answered. So he's saying what the people answered after he told them that they're not going to go into the promised land. He's recapping the story here. He says, then ye answered. He's saying the people. Ye is plural. All right? There, now you know how to read a King James Bible. Ye is plural. It means a group of people. So I'm, I'm talking to ye all tonight. Ye. I mean, that probably wasn't right. But, I mean, ye means a plural group of people. All right? And ye answered and said unto me, we have sinned against the Lord. We will go up and fight according to all that the Lord God commanded us. And when we had girded on every man his weapons of war, you were ready to go up into the hill. And the Lord said unto me, Say unto them, Go not up, neither fight, for I am not among you, lest ye be smitten before your enemies. And then later on in the chapter, they go do fight a battle, and they lose, and then they realize they shouldn't have done that. But the point is this. They got right. They got right right at the beginning, but there was still consequences. So it's silly to not get right because of consequences, because if you don't get right, you're going to have worse consequences. So if these people wouldn't have gotten right, God would have killed them all. He would have allowed them to just go into battle after battle, and they all would have died. But instead, he spared them. He told them, don't go any more battles. You're not going to have to fight. You're not going to go over into the promised land. And he just said, like, your punishment, there's still consequences for them, even though they did get right at that point. It, I mean, getting right doesn't mean no consequences will exist for what you did. That's not what it means. But the consequences will be worse the longer you wait getting right. So when it comes to getting right, the sooner the better. But people are like scared of consequences, so they don't want to get right. It's, it's a silly reason because the consequences are still going to be there. They're just going to be worse. The longer you hang on, the worse it will be. You gotta let it go. As soon as you have something that is a bad idea, as soon as you have something that you know is sin, you gotta let it go and take whatever is coming from that. But the longer you hang on, the more damage will be done. Not just to yourself. That's why it's been said that you know by many pastors, even beside myself. I've heard it preached for decades that sin will take you further than you want to go and keep you longer than you want to stay. Because people just can't let it go. The longer you hang on to sin. Look, sin is a sinking ship. And don't be like a rat that just goes down with the sinking ship because it's going down. It's going down. And the thing is, people that know the Bible... They know about the sin. But being afraid of consequences and not wanting to face the music, so to speak. I mean, look, I've seen this at work, and you will see this at work for your entire career. People that, and I've said this so many times to people in my career at work. Look, everybody makes mistakes. Look, it's inevitable that you are going to mess something up. It's guaranteed. But what the real problem is, is when you mess something up and then you try to blame it on somebody else. And then you try to cover it up. That's where the real damage is done. Because you have somebody that you work with, that you know, and that they, they do something like that, everybody knows it. And everybody knows, like, oh, that person just can't be trusted. Because they're, they're, not, they're not owning up to their sin. Just get it right. It's kind of like... We were talking about something the other day in church, and, you know, the best day to plant a tree is yesterday. The best time to get right? Last week. Well, you can't get right last week, so just do it now. That's what the Bible is teaching us. And here's the second reason right here. So consequences is a foolish one. Because if you're afraid of getting right because you're afraid of facing consequences, you're just kicking the can down the road and it's just going to get worse and worse and worse. It's just going to get worse for you down the road. You may not face it today, but what you face next week or next year or whatever is going to be way worse than you would have faced today. 
But the next one is this. Turn to James chapter number 5. Turn to James chapter number 5. Turn to James chapter number 5. Here's the second reason that people don't get right or that they resist getting right, even though they know they're wrong. And the second reason is this, pride. Or, you know, you could even say shame. But they're, they're prideful and they don't want to deal with the shame. Because, look, it's, it's, it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing to admit you're wrong. It's embarrassing to say, you know what, I, I messed that up. I did not do that right. Look at James chapter 5. And look at verse number 16. It's easy to do if you're a humble person. though. If you're a humble person and you know you're not perfect and you, you mess something up, the Bible says confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Look, I mean, the Bible here is just telling you, like, it's not telling you to go to a priest. It's telling you that if you've faulted someone, just go and, and confess it to them. If you've done something wrong to someone, go and get that thing right. Make it, I mean, most of the time, but the reason that this is a really silly excuse as well is because if you, you're embarrassed to admit wrong, here's the thing. Everyone knows you're wrong. Everyone knows that it's wrong. Everyone knows 99% of the time Somebody, even in the secular world that somebody makes a mistake in the workplace or wherever it is, like, everyone knows who did it. Everyone knows who's responsible. So if being embarrassed to admit wrong, like, there's really nothing you have to admit other than you're just kind of owning what everybody already else knows. So just get it done. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 7. And look, making excuses for something that's wrong is not owning it. That's not getting right. Yeah, I, I did mess that up, but, you know, Bob was really the one that led me down that path. That's not getting right. That is not doing, you know, what is called godly sorrow. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 7 and look at verse number 9. 1 Corinthians chapter number 7, look at verse number 9. The Bible talks about, in specific detail, what godly sorrow looks like, what this will look like from a Christian. All right? And it's really interesting. I've, I've read verse number 11 several times, but I want to focus on the couple verses before that in verse number 9. It says, Now I rejoice, not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. He's saying that you changed your mind and you got right. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner. So there is a godly sorrow, is what he's explaining, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. And then look at verse number 10. He says, for godly sorrow. So there's, there's different kinds of sorrow here, right? There's different kinds of sorrow. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. And what's interesting is if you look at verse number 12, so he goes through the detail in verse number 11 of what godly sorrow looks like. You know, that, that godly sorrow produces those things in verse number 11. It produces that fear. It produces that carefulness. So it's not just like, sorry, I wronged you, brother, and then you go and just do it again tomorrow. That's not a godly sorrow. A godly sorrow will produce carefulness and fear and a vehement desire and, and this revenge towards the fact that you did it in the first place. So what? So you'll, be, you'll have a repentant heart and you won't, you'll change your mind about how you're going to do things in the future. Going forward, you're going to be different. Because, look, you're not going to do well with your relationship. You're just like, sorry, every hour. You're like, sorry, sorry again, sorry again. People may be like, you're forgiven, brother, which is what they should do, but they may not just want to be around you anymore. That's the problem. So a godly sorrow, it worketh that, that desire to change the way that you do things so you don't repeat things. But look at verse number 12. This is what's interesting. This is what's interesting. Look at verse number 12. He says, Wherefore, though I wrote unto you, I did it not for his cause that had done the wrong. So note, he's, like, he's like, I didn't write this to you, this whole you know, thing on godly sorrow, so the person that did wrong here would, would be better. He's like, that's not who I did it for, nor for his cause that suffered the wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear unto you. Again, those wise, meaning the entire group. So he's saying, I didn't write this. I'm not 
preaching this doctrine to you in this letter so these two people will get right. Or really this one guy will get right and, and, you know, with this one person. He's like, that's not how we did it. He's like, I wrote it because I wrote it for the church. I wrote it for all of you. Because here, here's what's interesting. He's saying what's important is that you all understand this going forward. Because look, folks, if you look at what godly sorrow is, and you look at what Hosea is talking about, and you look at how God's goodness is always going to be there, and if we follow the Bible, it will be like rain, it will produce fruit, and then when we do things wrong, we fall into sin, we find out something is exceedingly sinful to us, and we just get that right through this process of godly sorrow, and we really make it right. Theoretically, if people would do this, and they would not resist through pride and they would not resist through fear of consequences and people would just do this every time theoretically there would be no lasting conflict between two christians isn't that interesting isn't that interesting that if this was practiced and look those two christians those two christians would not have to be perfect people because no one none of us is going to be without sin those two Christians, so theoretically, if this was practiced, two Christians or a church full of Christians would never have lasting conflict because people are going to do things wrong. That's why people that go to a church and always find something wrong with people in the church or find something wrong with the pastor or whatever, it's like, hey, good luck with trying to find a church because like, there's always something wrong with the people because I'm a people too, right? We're all people. And we're all going to do things wrong, but if people would just have godly sorrow and they would just confess their faults, they would realize, as soon as they realize, realize they did something wrong, they would confess it right away, they would get it right right away, they would make it right, and they would have that carefulness, that fear, that vehement desire to not do that again. Boy, would we have a conflict-free situation in our Christian lives. But look, that's not what people do. That's not what people do. You know, I was, I was thinking about this I was thinking about just this idea that if we could perfectly apply this philosophy, there would never be any problems. And, and here's an analogy I thought of. Brother Luke, Brother Max, and myself, we were tearing down a barn about two months ago. And we were just tearing down half this barn. So, I mean, it was a scene, man. I mean, we had this thing hooked up to a tractor with tow ropes. And, like, I assumed, you know, I was telling Brother Luke... And Brother Max, like, you cut everything, right? I only want to pull down half the barn. And I asked him again and again, like, you sure you cut everything? You sure there's nothing connecting half of the barn to this half of the barn? Because I don't want to pull the whole barn down. But, and, and he was like, yep, I cut everything, and everything's good, and, and we're going we're gonna to pull, I'm going to pull, I'm going to put this tractor in reverse, and I'm going to pull, and exactly half of this barn is going to fall down. Theoretically. Theoretically, that's how it should work. But what if he missed a post? Or what if he didn't cut through part of a wall? Or what if there was a few screws that he left in? If that was the case, we would have pulled the whole barn down. And that's exactly, I mean, I was thinking about that when I was thinking about just applying the Bible. Look, we pulled it, and they did cut everything, and exactly half the barn came down. And it's a great video. I'll show you after, after church if you want to see it. But the point is, if you take the Bible, not just this doctrine, if you take the Bible and you're like, you know what, I'm going to take this part right here. I'm going to take this part of the Bible, I'm going to apply this. And then you forget the rest of it. And you find out what's going on, you know, what, what, what kind of problems you got in your life. And I'm like, okay, I got to stay away from this chapter right here. I got to stay away from this chapter over here. And I got to only use like this part and this part. Guess what? You're going to pull the whole barn down is what's going to happen. Because theor theoretically, look, God's word is perfect. But if you don't use the whole thing... If you don't apply it the way God wrote it for you, and you don't apply the whole thing, it's not going to work. Just like theoretically, if we all apply this idea of godly sorrow, and we get rid of our pride, and we get rid of our fear of consequences that are coming anyway, 
that we will, the conflict in our lives will just get better and better and better and better. Just like that, applying the entire Bible to our lives, it'll work. It's a perfect theory. But if you apply it a piece at a time, it's not going to work. But if you take the whole thing, even the parts that you don't like, even the parts that you're not good at, even the part, look, and you probably know all the parts are there. If you take it and you just apply it piecemeal, it's not going to work for your family. It's not going to work for your marriage. It's not going to work passing down this reign, this goodness, to next generations and generation after generation after generation if you just take little pieces of it. If you don't take the whole thing. Look, everyone doesn't have to be perfect. You just have to apply the whole Bible. And the Bible is going to filter out. It's going to point out your imperfections. So it's not about, like, the law can't make you perfect. Impossible. You're going to be imperfect. No matter how mature Brother Benjamin said in his sermon the other night, no matter how much you learn and how much you apply and how many standards you get right in your life, you are not ever going to get there as you are physically on this earth. The race is not over till Jesus takes you to heaven. You're always going to have this flesh that we're wrestling with, but the idea is the way the Bible applies to us, it doesn't make us perfect but it will point out those imperfections and that will give us ways to deal with those imperfections. And your imperfections are different than my imperfections. So going around saying, I'm, I'm better than you, and I'm further than you, and all this kind of stuff is ridiculous because we all have different imper imper imperfections. And the Bible points out everybody's imperfections if you apply the whole thing. And then it shows you how to deal with those imperfections and how to work on those things going forward. But you've got to listen to the whole thing. You've got to apply the whole thing. You can't just pick and choose. You know, stay away from the stuff that points out you know, your problems, your sins, your struggles. You should focus more on the areas that, that hit the places that you, know, you struggle with personally. Hosea chapter number 6 is an appeal. It's an appeal to get right. And I want to appeal to all of you tonight in your lives that godly sorrow will not only get you right, but it will keep you right. So you have to let go of that fear of consequences. You have to let go of that pride and just get it right. Because guess what? God is telling us in Hosea chapter number six, he's like, He's like, at the first verse, he's like, just get right. Just get right. The rain is here. My goodness is here. You're fleeting. You're fleeting. You're like the dew. You're here and you're not and whatever. He's like, but just get right because my goodness is here waiting for you. It's a silly thing that we wouldn't do it. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.